Ah, hello there. Welcome to Serampore, India. I am William Carey. I have been asked to share a bit of myself with you this morning. But when I'm gone, I do not care that you know anything of William Carey. I care that you know more of William Carey's God. I have always been of a mind to, to finish whatever task I began. Even as a child, difficulties would rarely discourage me. The more I learned of a topic, the more I was determined to add to that knowledge. Now, when I was 14, I was, I was first apprenticed to a shoemaker. And while I would work, I would often amuse myself with various texts set before me. I found I had a particular affinity for the learning of languages. I experienced spiritual conversion at the age of 17 years, and, and with my passion for literature and my newfound faith, I was able to quickly acquire a, a thorough knowledge of where there was, um, there was Latin and Dutch, Greek, Hebrew, and French. Still working on English. <laughs> but. I was wholly unaware of the foundation being laid for the work that I am about today. Although, it was during a reading of Captain Cook's Voyages Round the World that my sympathy for the heathen nations was first impacted upon my mind. When I was 21, I was, I was asked to begin preaching to a small group. Having no formal education, I cannot tell why I complied. But it was in this state of uncertainty of the gospel doctrines and, and having so slight an acquaintance with fellow ministers that I was obliged to draw all from the Bible alone. Do you know what I found? I am not my own, nor would I choose for myself. Let God employ me where he thinks fit and then Give me the patience and discretion to fill up my station to his honor and glory. Now, a short time later, I did join a small group of fellow ministers for discussions of doctrine and theology on Sunday evenings. At one of these meetings, it was, uh, it was the autumn. Autumn of 1787. I remember it quite well. I was asked to suggest a topic for discussion that evening. Now, as the junior minister in the group, it was with some reluctance that I asked the question, have the churches of today done all they ought to have done for the heathen nations? Well, scarcely had the words escaped my lips when the <clears throat> senior minister, Mr. Ryland, retorted something like this. Young man, sit down. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he will do it without your aid or mine. As you might imagine, the discussion that evening was severely shortened. But was the Great Commission not go into all the world and preach the gospel? You see, it seemed to be the opinion of, of many that, that because the apostles were extraordinary officers, and had no defined successors, and because many of the things which were right for them to do would be utterly unwarrantable for us, therefore it may not be immediately binding upon us to execute the commission, though it was binding upon them. I was not to be deterred, though. I can plod. I can persevere in any definite pursuit. I believe few people know what may be accomplished until they try and then persevere in what they undertake. Over the, over the next few years, I, I wrote down many of these same thoughts and, and published them into a small manifesto. It was early 1792. I tried to keep the title as short as possible, but well, let, let's see what you think. It, it was called an inquiry into the obligation of Christians to use means for the conversion of heathens in which the religious state of the different nations of the world, the success of the former undertakings, and the practicability of further undertakings are considered. <laughs> Perhaps I should have worked a little harder. A, a few months later, 
May 1792, I, I preached it from Isaiah 54. For I believe the desolate widow is a picture of the church of God. The widow is commanded to enlarge her tent so that there could be an increase in her family. A little later in the chapter, it is stated that her maker is her husband. I believe that our maker is saying this. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. So a few months later, October 1792, we established our first mission board. And a little more than a year later, November 10, 1793, after a five-month voyage, I arrived with my family in Calcutta, India. It would be seven years before we were to see our first convert. But I can plod. I can persevere. For if it be the duty of all men when the gospel comes to believe unto salvation, then it is the duty of those of us who are entrusted with the gospel to endeavor to make it known among all the nations of the world for the obedience of faith. We are commanded to lay up treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, nor thieves break in and steal. It is also declared that whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. What a treasure. What a harvest it must be for such characters as, as Paul and Barnabas and others who have laid themselves out wholly for the work of the Lord. What a heaven it will be to see the many myriads of poor heathens who by their labors, by their labors and ours, have come to the knowledge of God. Surely, a crown of rejoicing such as this is worth striving for. Surely, it is worthwhile to lay ourselves out with all our might in promoting the cause and the kingdom of Christ. Will you plod? Will you persevere with me? Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. Thank you.